Hi everyone, welcome to episode 12 of Paranormal Among Us. Today we are going to head north to Alaska and talk with pilot Theo Chesley. He's the owner of Precision Air up near Anchorage, Alaska. I saw his story not too long ago on the History Channel, did some research and was able to get in touch with him, and we talked for quite a bit. And what a great story he has to share. Well, you know, not just one story, but he has two stories near the same location. But before we get to Theo Chesley's interview, I want to remind everyone to like and subscribe to this channel. That way you won't miss anything that comes out in the future. Also, if you had a paranormal experience, uh, you know, seen a ghost, toured a haunted location, or by chance seen something unexplained in the skies above, I'd love to hear about it. Drop me an email at paranormalamongus72 at gmail.com. That's paranormalamongus72 at gmail.com. I'll be more than happy to share it on a future episode. And Theo Chesley, thank you for joining me up in Alaska near uh, Anchorage. How you doing, Theo? Oh, doing good. Doing just good. fine. Good, awesome. Thank you for joining me. Um, and you're the uh, the owner of Precision Air up there, right? That is correct. What what exactly do you do? You do just you take passengers places, or what's what? What do you do? Oh, we do it all. We're twin engine charter. We're just basically glorified taxi drivers. When we get mm -hmm. a call, somebody wants to move either freight or uh, passengers or both or anything, we'll, we pretty much fly everything. And how long have you been flying up in Alaska? Oh, let's see. I've been flying by 30, 38 years. Not all 30. of it in Alaska. I've flown all over the United States. Uh, Miami, Midwest, L.A. Basin, uh, Las Vegas, Grand Canyon, Northwest, all over. So you've had plenty of, of years of experience uh, flying um, around this uh, the country of ours. Um, and, and you had an incident back in uh, 2019. Oh, uh, we actually had two incidents. Uh -huh. uh, but yes, 2019, actually, I believe it was... Uh, thinking back now, I believe it was October of 2019 and then April of 2020, but that might be 18 and 20. I'm not, I, it's been a while. I haven't even, I haven't looked at the dates, you know, in, in a while. Yeah. It's already 2023. Yeah, I know. Time flies, Where, doesn't it? Where's the time going? <laughs> yeah. Um, so tell me about that, that first uh, uh, sighting that you saw there. Well, uh, it was kind of caught us off guard. We're on a, a pretty crystal clear day, uh, you know, not high cirrus clouds on a flight, routine charter flight from Sandpoint, Alaska to uh, Dutch Harbor. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were about oh, an hour into the flight, I would say, and going by an active volcano by the name of Mount Shishalden that's uh, 9,404 uh, feet above uh, sea level straight up from the water and uh we spotted something about 30 miles beyond the mountain as we were approaching it it's it's on a regular flight path uh and uh that particular day we were bucking some winds at about 20 knots and uh, chose to go on the northwest side of the mountain just because of turbulent possible turbulence if we were on the other side right. uh anyhow so we were cruising along and we were about 10 miles uh before the mountain and spotted some kind of horizontal disc shaped ring with a little wisp coming from the tail of it. It wasn't an actual saucer, but it was a ring perfectly symmetrical in a horizontal fashion. And that ring was, yeah, we estimated 20 to 30 miles past the mountain. Okay. Um, and it was real visible. So it had to be fairly large. I mean, it was at least, a, I, want, I want to say a good a good half mile or three quarters of a mile wide. I want to say, because if we could see it that far away, I mean, it had to be fairly significant. Right. Um, and we just, so we kept motoring on on our flight path and just, you know, this object or disc or smoke ring or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it caught our attention. And it basically moved towards the mountain with the wind. We were bucking wind and we were going against the wind. It was going with the wind and it sort of, it kind of changed shape and so went from perfectly symmetrical 
in a horizontal fashion and then uh, actually sort of turned vertical and became more of a circle shape but not a perfect circle i right. mean it wasn't it was more like an oblong type of shape i've got quite a few pictures of it mm-hmm. uh and it sort of came up again uh you know about two miles on the s- east side of the mountain and sort of parked uh so- the only reason i say it it was moving, but then as we were flying by, it sort of stopped and stayed in one position. Mm-hmm. Now, when you encounter normal clouds, or if, if you see like a smoke ring like that, as it travels or, and the wind pushes it, it, it'll lose its shape and kind of tear apart, correct? Yeah, that's what I would have thought. Uh, right. I called the Volcanic Advisor, uh, obs- uh, Observatory about it, and gave him the pictures they claimed it was a smoke ring i said well it might have been a smoke ring but smoke rings don't hold their shape in 20 knots of wind and up and upper levels that that particular ring was probably at about the oh i want to say the thirteen thousand foot level Mm -hmm. winds are pretty significant at that altitude right so any sort of smoke ring would have not held its shape if it indeed would have come out of let's just say that particular volcano it would have dissipated pretty quick right uh it might have went with the wind for a minute or two and then lost its shape uh there are other volcanoes to the southwest of shishaldan that could have possibly spit that smoke ring out but again with that kind of wind up there it's not going to hold its shape so that's why this whole thing got my attention Mm -hmm. it's like wait this is not something normal here this should be long gone and mm-hmm. it wasn't. So your point's taken, uh, mm-hmm. and it's correct. It would have disappointed, uh, dissipated. And when you when you call the uh, volcano, um, I forgot what you called it. Um, it's is it the the volcano wasn't erupting or producing plumes of smoke at the time, was it? Uh not uh, very wisps. Uh, okay, the so. volcano. This was the interesting part. The volcano became active about a week before that. It, it's an off and on volcano, mm-hmm. which means uh, sometimes it's real active, sometimes not so much. Uh, mm-hmm. This and then it can lay dormant for years, a year, yeah. two, six months, maybe eight months. Yeah. Uh, this particular time, uh, it had been active, so it it was shooting some very small whiffs wisps of uh uh white smoke out some steam Mm -hmm. but no visible ash to speak of and it wasn't in any sort of major eruption mode it was just uh basically venting yeah okay um and you know i I know there's been reports in alaska in the mountains and everything that there's a lot of uh uap or ufo activity out there somewhere so i mean this could have been, you know, possibly a portal, a wormhole that was opening up or something that you, you happen to witness. Uh, yeah, that's, well, the thing that kind of caught my attention, it was beyond the mountain 20 miles, and then it sort of floated mm-hmm. over and parked and then went sideways. And I think you're absolutely right. Some, something was up over there. Uh, you know, it when it turned, hor- uh, you know, into a vertical fashion, you know, first it's going along in a horizontal and then it turned this way. Yeah. So and then it parked by the mountain. And so as we're going by, and this all happened in a period of about, you know, I want to say maybe eight minutes, six mm-hmm. to eight minutes, because we were cruising at, a, you know, basically 200 miles an hour going by this mountain. And we see something uh, initially, then it comes over and parks. And by this time we're on the side of the mountain and all this happened pretty quickly so as we're watching the spear we're watching the mountain something a wisp of smoke with something inside of the of it a black object and normally when the mountain's venting it's either black or it's white but not both and you Mm -hmm. can see something pretty visible inside this white little shroud of smoke look like a look like a top almost And you could see sort of a vortices coming off the top of it. And this sort of popped out of the mountain. We're taking pictures. So it's real hard to define as we're taking pictures. We're not really watching the sphere anymore. We're watching what's coming out of the mountain. And we're sort of, you know, toggling back and forth saying, okay. And then, uh, and and just within a, a couple of frames later, 
after this, uh, this object comes out of the mountain, all of a sudden that sphere that is sitting on the side of the mountain in a vertical, like a vertical ring, much like, as you said, a portal, mm -hmm. uh, something flies in it. We didn't see the object fly into it because we something else happened on the mountain. There was a green sphere down towards the middle of the mountain that sort of appeared for not long, mm -hmm. uh, which we got pictures of that too. Mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't see it move. We just got pictures of it. And then all this is happening at a pretty fairly high rate of speed. So we look back up at the sphere and something had flown into the sphere and pulled it into sort of a noose. So what was a normal ring, now the top of that ring had a sort of a, a neck so to speak, is something was pulling that ring towards upper atmosphere. And really? the ring had turned into sort of a teardrop shape, perfect teardrop. And we have pictures of that too. Uh, so at that point, something really crazy is going on. We're looking at all this. I got passengers aboard and I'm going, yeah, it's time to, we need to uh, bug out of here. So you, did you ever think of, I mean, on. if if passengers weren't in the in the plane, would you have, maybe gone closer to it and see if you can got a better look at it or you know thinking back now um probably not but my curiosity level was at an all-time high at that point mm -hmm. and i'm always thinking well what if i would have went over there and really checked it out um but at the same time uh yeah there's been so many weird occurrences yeah. in alaska aircraft disappearances for absolutely no reason at all with good equipment, good pilots. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I was thinking, you know, I don't want to get, I'm not the guy that needs to be in the paper getting read about. So we just continued yeah. on to Dutch Harbor and uh, the flight went uh, uneventfully uh, after that well, that's and good. returned the aircraft to Sand Point uh, that just uh, an hour and a half later. And there was uh, nothing happening at the mountain at that point. Wow. I mean, so, I mean all, all this so, stuff going on, <laughs> were you paying attention to where the plane was going? <laughs> I mean, I'd be looking at well, everything that's else. Just, yeah. You know, that's the thing. We're trying to take pictures. I'm also looking for possible traffic. You, yeah. there, occasionally you'll get marine uh, birds up there at that level. So you got to be watching for birds, traffic. But, you know, we're in a pretty secluded part of the state. There's not a lot of air travel going on there just because of the proximity. And there's a way, a way out, you know. Yeah. Long way, long way from Kansas, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that really wasn't our concern, but you still got to be paying attention. Yeah. Uh, to exactly. your flight path. So, yeah. So taking pictures, paying attention to the aircraft, making sure we're still on course, trying to watch the sphere, saw a green orb on the side of the mountain, saw something fly out of the mountain. Uh, all this recorded on pictures. And, uh, you know, I got a lot of comments. This kind of went on YouTube after the initial show uh, in Aliens in Alaska. And I got a lot of comments. Mm -hmm. Well, why didn't you video it? You're trying to, there's just no way you can take a video that would give right. it credibility uh, because of the proc how far the initial object was. But pictures, however, if, they're, if you got a good megapixel camera, mm -hmm. can be enlarged. Mm -hmm. And you can actually get a pretty good look. Now, I wish I would have had a 24 megapixel camera at that point. I yeah. was shooting this off my phone, but I believe was a 12 megapixel. Yeah. Uh, which still gave us some pretty good clarity. Uh, not as great yeah. as I would have wanted. But still, it was uh, it was no mistake in what we were seeing. And, you know, it was taking a movie and trying to fly a plane, like you said, trying to watch everything, I mean, that's going to be kind of hard to do. I mean, taking a picture is hard enough, but holding it up there and actively uh, virtually you know, keeping impossible. it in there. And, yeah. No, it yeah. would have been virtually impossible, especially if you're trying to zoom in, fly the airplane. There was just, yeah, there was a lot, there's yeah. way too much going on. And and it, the, the video would have been jerky, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're trying to zoom in, and then there would have been no... Uh, you know, when I tried to take the pictures, I tried to keep the mountain in view so you could see how the proximity was changing of this right. object. It wasn't right. just in one spot. It was moving, uh, which was strange. I mean, you know, yeah. at the very least, it was not normal. And I've right. seen thousands and thousands of clouds 
you know, 20,000 flight hours. I've seen about mm-hmm. everything. And I don't claim to have seen everything, but I've seen about everything. Yeah, exactly. There's always something new and you're always learning something new in an airplane. And if yeah. you keep that sort of mind intact, you'll do okay. But the second yeah. you think you know it all or seen it all, you're in for problems. Yeah. Now you said the other one was six months later than this. Six months later, uh, first one happened in late October, the second one in late April. Mm -hmm. Uh, Again, the mountain had calmed down and went dormant. And all of a sudden, about a week before the second occurrence, the mountain started up again. Uh, This was was quite a bit different and even, to be honest, more chilling. Uh, I was by myself in a different aircraft, same sort of model aircraft, but another company aircraft, not the same one. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it was the same deal. We were a routine flight going into Dutch Harbor to pick up some folks. I was empty at this point, so I was by myself. And it was a crystal clear day. There were no clouds, no anything. So uh, since the first occurrence, uh, I was a very candid audience when I was flying by this mountain. So mm-hmm. I was always ready to hopefully see something and, and not sort of wishing for what I didn't want, but at the same time, curious of what might be there. Yeah. Uh, so I'm coming along, taking pictures of the mountain and just beautiful, clear day. And uh, there's not one cloud in the sky. I've got pictures to prove that. All of a sudden, I looked out my left window as I'm going by the mountain And in the exact same spot where that particular cloud smoke ring went vertical and stopped, there was a shrouded cloud that appeared out of nowhere because I didn't see it going in. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really paying attention. Again, I'm looking forward, controlling the airplane, making sure everything's good. It's a clear day, nothing to see here. Look out my left window and all of a sudden there's a, large cloud that appeared out of nowhere shrouded looked like it was came out of i don't know what but there was an object inside of it Mm -hmm. and i'm like going what the heck and i'm like looking and i'm like okay camera time so i'm taking pictures again i'm putting the mountain in perspective of where this object was and if you compare the two occurrences it's pretty much the exact same spot Really? Now, this cloud was large. It had a lot of wisps towards the back and towards the front of this cloud. Um, and I sent you pictures of this. Yeah, and I'll put these uh, pictures up as well. Here. Here. Yeah, uh, the cloud appeared to be, uh, how do I put it? Whatever object was in there appeared to be very cold because it looked like the air was like freeze-dried around. And I, maybe I'm using the wrong term here. But when you see super cooled air, it looks very not frothy, but loose. Right. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was noticing that in the pictures. So what happened was, and this is all in a period of about five to six minutes again, uh, this object inside there started to change. Uh, it became more defined, uh, more active. There were things going on inside of this cloud that it was either trying to cloak itself in and you know again i've seen a lot of clouds i've seen uh, you know and the pictures speak for themselves it's yeah. obvious there's something right there now maybe you one could say it was warm air coming out of the mountain and hitting cold air and created some sort of crazy cloud okay uh, i might be able to buy that but yeah. to be honest when you look at this cloud and uh, seeing how it came out of nowhere the mountain wasn't that active yeah. The mountain had a little bit of uh, steam that was just rolling down the side of the mountain, downwind of it. So it wasn't like it was puffing a bunch of hot air. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so this object, cloud, shroud, cloak, whatever you want to call it, appeared. And it morphed into something pretty damn crazy. I mean, it, yeah. it kept getting more defined, more defined. Uh, something was going on below this craft. It looked like it had a vortice coming out of the back of it, some sort of tail with a some sort of propulsion 
it looked like to me. But again, you know, I'm looking at the pictures and one can only, you know, speculate what was actually happening. Right. Right. Uh, but as I went by and I kept going again, I'm on a direct course for Dutch Harbor and I'm continuing that course. So we have sunlight to deal with this. A lot of the problem with taking pictures out of an aircraft is with its uh, plexiglass windows on mm -hmm. these particular aircraft. And uh, when there's sun in the glare, uh, you'll start to lose what would be a real clear picture becomes more hazy and more hazy as the glare starts to reflect off the plexiglass. So as I was sort of uh, motoring towards Dutch Harbor, I'm still taking many pictures. I probably took 25 pictures. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the trajectory, trajectory of the picture taking in the aircraft and the object was fading as the aircraft continued on its course. Yeah. That being said, as that was all happening, the this object morphed into something that I couldn't even begin to even speculate what it was but it looked like a craft with a wing a landing gear or something crazy but you see it in the pictures i sent you yeah um it came it turned from a very large a larger craft uh and then had activity below it either uh it looked, it almost looked like tentacles or something or, or something coming out of the bottom of it that was mm -hmm. either doing something with another craft or something, but I mean, it's all real visible. Yeah. And then, uh, and then the whole craft turned into something that I can't even say what it was. Almost looked like a space shuttle out of Star Trek, but it had arms and legs. I mean, and I'm not kidding when I say that. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, you look, at, you look at those pictures and, so when I, you know, looked at it all and I'm like on, and again, it was, it was, uh, the pictures were not as clear as the initial ones mm -hmm. at the end of this picture shoot and this occurrence. Mm -hmm. But when I went back in, uh, through a little contrast in the pictures to, to actually see exactly what we were looking at, right. it's pretty astounding. Yeah. I'm a big uh, fan of um, the TV show uh, Secrets of Skinwalker Ranch, and and they've been doing tests where they take a helicopter over the ranch, and the the instruments kind of mess up. The, you know, the the GPS is is off, and it and it tells you that they're they're, sh they're they're lower in the sky than they are. Did anything happen to you in your airplane when you were doing that when you're flying this? That's a good point. Uh, while this was all going on, there was not, uh, there was no anomalies with the aircraft. I went to Dutch Harbor, which was about another 40 minutes from that area mm -hmm. landed. And I, I believe I was on a freight mission because I came back alone again. So I think I had parts or something in that aircraft, but on the way back, um, again, candid audience, same route of flight, mm -hmm. um, flight path trajectory, everything is the same except for now I got a little bit of tailwind and everything is as advertised, except mm -hmm. for about 10 miles from the mountain. I'm staring at the mountain. I'm not really paying too much attention to the airplane because we're on autopilot, everything as, as advertised. Mm -hmm. um, I look down at my heading and I'm 30 degrees off pointed straight for the mountain. I was probably seven miles away from the mountain outside of it. I wasn't really heading straight for it. Uh, but my flight path would probably take me four four miles outside the mountain. So you know we weren't like mm -hmm. dead up against this mountain at all. We were we were basically flying by in a flight path that took us away from you know not not close right. to it. Right. But I looked down and the autopilot was uh, I mean our flight path was thirty degrees off. So I'm like going okay what the heck. Um, so I and. You know, I've flown a lot with autopilots. Occasionally, you'll have an issue, but this particular aircraft and that autopilot has been really solid. Yeah. So I looked at it and I go, okay, well, what's going on here? So I flipped it off, uh, corrected the aircraft's course back on course mm -hmm. and on a flight trajectory back to Sandpoint, set up the autopilot again, and then started started paying attention to the mountain again looking for anything that might be going on 
I looked down about two minutes later and here we are once again we're 30 degrees off course heading straight for the mountain I'm like on what the heck is going on here so I'm thinking oh. okay I must have an issue with the autopilot yeah. I'm not really thinking that at the time you know I'm not thinking is the is the mountain drawing the aircraft toward it because of a magnetic disturbance mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking that at the time I'm thinking equipment failure right you know because I, I just wasn't really putting two to two together right uh so <clears throat> I, I manually i switched the autopilot autopilot off manually fly the aircraft by the mountain on the same flight path uh mm -hmm. we're cruising and about 15 miles past i'm thinking okay i gotta try this autopilot again i gotta see what's going on here so i flipped the autopilot on it was perfect all the way back to sample i never had an anomaly really so that was really strange uh, but that happened. Uh, the funny thing was, is that initially on the first flyby when we had the occurrence, yeah, there was no magnetic, magnetic disturbance. But after we came back, there was something going on over there. And it was telling the aircraft, no, you come this way. You know, wow. uh, those, what happens, those, the autopilots are, are hooked up to a magnetic compass. And these compasses are very, very fine tuned. They're very uh -huh. expensive. A very intricate part of the aircraft yeah so when one starts to uh get pulled away these things are designed to you know magnetic north all the time they're, they they mm -hmm. know where they're at they're supposed to be but when you have a magnetic disturbance like that it will pull that compass off mm -hmm. uh at this particular time it did not once but twice till we got by the mountain so mountain had a magnetic draw not sure what that was all about uh, if it had something to do, obviously must have had something to do, but yeah, uh, it's been a, yeah, um, I've probably flown past that mountain a hundred times since then. Uh, and every time I'm always thinking about it, always looking, haven't seen anything, but there's and, a village about 30 miles. Oh, go ahead, sir. And have you, um, had any more problems with the uh, autopilot pa uh, flying past that mountain? No, no, never. No, not really? at all. No. Um, huh. well, none that none that I could actually record and put my finger on, you know. Uh, I haven't yeah. really been thinking about that anymore. Too busy looking at the mountain, yeah. but it hasn't, you know, pulled me off course, but anything like that. But what I was getting at earlier, there's a village about 30 miles uh, below that mountain to the northeast side of it. Yeah. A small village called Falls Pass. And I've talked to a lot of old timers there and they've told me that there is a lot of, a lot of activity in the evening that they've seen. Uh, they can't quite put their finger on it, but a lot of light lights buzzing around and really crazy things going on in the sky. And these are old timers, not anybody, you know, they have no reason to be making anything up, Yeah, but yeah, there's definitely something going on over there. And, you know, this has been sort of a, uh uap mo so to speak a lot of, of volcanoes mm -hmm. and uh, i talked to a gentleman uh, david childress about a lot of this stuff and he says yeah there's been a lot of occurrences around volcanoes especially when they're active yeah so uh that being said uh you know That's, uh, yeah whether whether there was or not uh i think something was going on not once but twice and that, and to me, that's really rare to see something. At, oh, and then the other part was it was exactly the same time in the morning when I went on really? both of those flights at ten fifteen a.m. in the morning, and I believe one was ten seventeen. And I didn't really realize this till I went back and looked at the time signature on the pictures, and I go, "Well, that's odd." Yeah, you, know, that you is don't really weird. think about that. You, you look back, and it's like, so I like to do the morning flights. Yeah. Um, I'm always happy when I'm departing about 10, 9 30 in the morning when I'm going to go by that mountain just because, <laughs> hey, if that's the time they're over there having breakfast, yeah. I'd like to go out and see what they're doing. <laughs> so, so if, you're, doing something. if you're a passenger of Theo's and you go by that mountain around 10 15 or whatever in the morning, make sure you have your video camera ready that's just in case. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> passenger wise, not pilot wise, right? <laughs> That may not be good advertising, okay? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'd buy it. <laughs> I'd go. Right? Come on yeah. now, we'll check it out. Yeah, that's awesome. 
That's awesome. And, you know, have you, you've never witnessed anything like this in any other part of the country that you've flown in, have you? No, no, not flying. Um, we commercial fish during the summertime in the mm -hmm. Bering Sea. We've seen a couple of occurrences out there, but nothing to this magnitude. Yeah. Um, we've seen strange lights and stuff at two, three o'clock in the morning that probably shouldn't have been there, but, yeah. um, you know, very, very rare when we refer to other guys that had fished the Bering Sea, which is by the way, right on the doorstep of this mountain as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, uh, well, that's just, uh, yeah, no, nothing to this magnitude. Yeah. Well, Theo, this is really awesome. And, you know, when I first started talking to you, and actually before that, when I saw your story on the History Channel, my my arm hairs were standing up. This was it was freaky. It was, it was pretty darn cool. And then, yeah. you know, talking to you more, this is this is very, very interesting. And, you know, I, I wish I could just come up there right now and do that, do the interview, you know, with you in the plane or something and maybe see something. That would be pretty cool. Well, at some point you should come to Alaska and we will definitely uh, take a flight. Uh, may not be around that mountain, but we'll definitely show you some of the yeah. better sites of Alaska and uh, who knows what's out there. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Theo, I really appreciate you taking the time to um, chat with us. Um, it's telling me that the time's about, we have about eight minutes left. Um, so, I mean, I, I appreciate you taking the time. Stay safe out in the air and uh, thank you again. Appreciate it. You too, my friend. And if you need any more information, any more pictures, feel free to email me, call me, or text. All right, we'll do. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for this episode. Special thanks to Theo Chesley from Precision Air up in Alaska for joining me today. Hopefully one of these days I'll make it up to Alaska and be able to fly around with him and, of course, document everything that we see as we look for aliens. Um, and thank you for watching this episode. Remember, if you or someone you know has a paranormal story to share, please email me at paranormalamongus72 at gmail.com. That's paranormalamongus72 at gmail.com. And I'll be more than happy to read your story on a future episode. Until next time, everyone, stay safe out there. And I'll see you on the next episode of Paranormal Among Us. Paranormal Among Us.